Clover was founded as a uh, result of the fundraising drive to establish a school in Cape Town for people who were then classified as colored. The only school that existed was a school for white people in Worcester, and that school would not take the person, Mr. Isaac Jacobs, who was blind. He could not go to school because he was not white. The problem that the school had at the time, and their excuse was, we have no problem in accepting the child, but the issue is accommodation. Because in terms of the South African law, there was no way that a colored person could have been a declared white area. So that was the excuse that they used. I just think that they were all racist and they didn't like anybody who isn't, who isn't of their make. And so today they all want to progress or show or project as if they the institutions have nothing to be ashamed of. They've got lots of ashamed of. But on the other hand, if it wasn't for that tragedy, Lofa would not have existed. It was then that they decided to create a school for the people who were not allowed to go to the white school. And in order to raise funds for that school, Mr. Isaac Jacobs, who was then a, a, a he was an accomplished violinist, beautiful violinist and uh, went around the country with Reverend Blackstone and others and uh, had um, public meetings. Those days people like to come to meeting because you were not going to be thrown by a chair or anything at that time. But they used to come to the meetings, at, in the civic halls they had meetings, spoke about the need to raise funds for the, for the school and to open the school and they then started the school, and the school was called the Athlone School for the Blind, because it was in Athlone, and the Earl of Athlone at that time opened the school. Uh, and it was a school where there were, I think, seven, two, <coughs> seven children or so. Uh, I must get that, that num those numbers correct, but Mr. Isaac Jacobs then enrolled for formal education, first time, when he was probably 16, 17 years old. Or well, 19 years old for that matter, 19 years old. He enrolled for formal schooling for the first time. He must have got his schooling from his family, uh, and somehow or the other he became, he was a very articulate, independent blind person. Before there was independence development and independent program, uh, he used to walk around Grassy Park uh, with his white cane. No long cane at that time, but he used to know where he was and where to go. And of course, obviously, lots of people to help him across the road and so on. But they then went around the country, formed these Friends of the Blind groups. Uh, and I think there might have been tens of those groups around the country. And when the school was then formally established, uh, now they had a further problem. There were some blind people around who obviously didn't go to school, who needed to be attended to, and they then formed what they called the League of Friends of the Blind. And the name comes from the 1930s, 30s, uh, somewhere there. The, the, everything that was grouped was not called the Union, it was the League or something, like we had the Teachers League of South Africa. And most of those people had connections with the Teachers League of South Africa. So when they had an organization like that, they would obviously call it the League uh, of Friends of the Blind, because they had all these friends of the blind. Uh, so that's where the name comes from. It derives its name from the time, the context of the time, where uh, organizations of groups were called the League, like the League of Nations, which is now the United Nations. And then those, that's what it was called in those days. So they then started this organization just to, to do two things. One is to provide accommodation for the ladies who would complete their vocational training at the Athens School for the Blind. 
It was not much about academic training. It was more vocational training. And they would then work in Cape Town because the Society for the Blind in Cape Town could get the factory where they could work, do weaving, uh, cane work, um, and then make some other work and, and knitting and that kind of thing. And those people needed to be housed somewhere. That's why the League of Women Blind then started a hostel for blind ladies. But the need at the time was to, to help blind people with material needs. And so that's how it started. But it started really as a, I would say as a protest against the discriminatory system. And that has been the way that low has always been. Uh, in spite of who comes, we are very activist. So we, 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 we fight discrimination. Uh, all the time. Even now, 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 right now, today, you will hear of discrimination against blind people, and LOFO would be the activist organization that would deal with it. So that's how the school, I mean, the League of Friends of the Blind started. It did not start as this big organization that you see now. 